literature, but uh, also for a lot of people in industry. Um, and, and it's really a great opportunity for, for the sort of crosstalk between um, academia. Oh, there goes the mic now. <laughs> it's a really exciting time right now to be in genomics, I was saying, and it's a, especially an exciting time for the crosstalk between um, academia and, uh, and biotech. Um, and I'm going to give some examples of how our center, the Stanford Genome Technology Center, has been involved in that crosstalk, and, and hopefully we can, we can foster further crosstalk as we go. So the reason that we're all here right now is because uh, genomics is in an era where we have way more data than we know what to do with. Um, this this uh, image was already published in Nature eight years ago, um, and it was true then, and it's even truer right now. Um, we, we are just uh, sort of overwhelmed. And the main driving factor in this is, is the uh, massive drops in uh, genome sequencing costs. And all of us in genomics have seen some sort of a variant of this of this image, and uh, the first the first human genome, which was was sequenced by the Human Genome Project, cost anywhere between hundreds of millions or a billion or three billion, depending on who you ask for the exact cost uh, to sequence. And now we can do it for less than a thousand dollars, and that's really been precipitated by massive technological breakthroughs that have enabled um, DNA sequencing to be done very cheaply. And these are sort of annotated here um, along this uh, along this very classical curve that we're that we're all growing tired of seeing in genomics. But um, it's, that's what makes it such an exciting time, because we can do so much more. And this has obviously continued to drop um, now in 2017. Um, and, and it's been driven by specific technologies. Um, and this is also where our center kind of got into it. So our center was set up to, uh, to develop automated sequencing technology for the Human Genome Project, um, first to sequence the yeast genome, and then and then to enable that, so that was, you know, kind of earlier in the curve, um, sort of before this happened, sorry. Um, and uh, our mission uh, since then has been to decrease the costs of genomic analysis and genomic technologies while increasing the throughput and quality of data. Um, we've been working very hard to establish innovative technologies to study genome biology, both in terms of what the sequences of genomes are and what, what their output is. Um, and really deploying these technologies, and we've been quite successful at deploying a lot of these technologies. We have about 30 companies that have been founded by our scientists and inventors, um, inventions. One of them is sitting on this panel right now. Um, and right now, we're also working on uh, improving diagnostic approaches uh, to, to facilitate um, better medicine and advance the science of medicine and, again, cut the costs of healthcare. Um, and this is, this is something that the, we're part of an entire field that's working towards this. This is uh, to, really to use the, use the information in genomes to improve the science of medicine and improve the way that patient care is delivered. Um, and this is a, this is a sort of um, trajectory that was developed by the National Human Genome Research Institute um, several years ago. I like to show this because I think it shows that we're still always learning about the structure of genomes, but we're, we're gradually um, again, moving forward um, in all of these areas because, because of technology developments. Um, certainly, that's, that's one of the, the major driving forces. But making use of that data, despite all of the genome sequences that we have, we have thousands of genome sequences available to us right now, but we only have 59 actionable genes. And that means genes where if we, if we detect a certain variant in the clinic where there's actually something that you can do about the disease that, that you might be, uh, that you will be contracting. Um, and that's out of, you know, tens of thousands of genes. So there's clearly a lot more work to do. Um, and why has it been so challenging to identify useful information from the genome? Well, genomics is far beyond the genome. Um, the genome is just one, one dimension of it. The output of the genome is incredibly important for its impact on, on your health and, uh, and wellness throughout your lifetime. Uh, and certainly, um, the microbiome is certainly also a... Uh, a very hot area of research right now. These are all of the microorganisms that live within us and, and sort of control um, very important things like metabolism, immunology, and more. Um, the epigenome in terms of modifications that happen to the genome uh, that are either a consequence of our environment or other exposures that we come into. Um, and then certainly like higher level phenotypes that we can see through imaging, cellular phenotypes, and so on. And so this is, I mean, even this is a simplification. And to understand how your genome impinges on your health, you really need to consider all of these layers and probably more that we don't even know about yet um, to, to really uh, make sense of what's going on and to get, to, to get actionable information um, out of the genome, because that's what we're here for. And one, one really, um, 
great example of this that, uh, that our center has been focused on recently is, uh, is chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, this is a very complex disease, um, and it's, it's known, um, so this is right here is um, my, my boss, Ron Davis. He's the director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center, and he, he has a very ill son, and this is why we've been starting to focus on this disease. Um, and the more we looked into it, we realized, you know, this is, it's completely invisible. Um, how many of you in the audience have heard of chronic fatigue syndrome? Okay, that's quite a lot. That's good. How many of you know very much about it? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was us a few years ago, too. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, prevailing assumption about chronic fatigue syndrome is that it's, it's people have a lot of fatigue and they're just really tired and they can't get over it. Um, and that's a really, really big oversimplification, unfortunately. It's kind of invisible. You don't see a lot of patients. How many of you know somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome? Okay. Yeah. Um, and those of you who know uh, probably realize that you'll see, you'll see your friends or colleagues on days when, on regular days, and they'll look just like me standing up and talking to people. Um, but when they're sick, they're really sick and they're out of it and you don't see them. And this is what makes it really invisible. And it's estimated to affect um, anywhere between 0.4 and 1% of the population, which means at least a million people in the United States and several million worldwide. Um, but what's really difficult about this is that, you know, it's an incredibly heterogeneous disease. Um, every pa it looks different in every patient. Um, there's all kinds of cognitive muscular symptoms. Actually, the main characterizing uh, symptom of the disease is exertion intolerance, um, where, where if patients exert themselves, and that can mean going for a run to getting up to wash the dishes or even sensory input, um, they can crash for days or, or weeks. Um, it's really... Uh, it's really a tragic disease and we don't know what to do with it. Um, and it's been really neglected because there's been this sort of psychosomatic association with it. Oh, you're fatigued, you're depressed. Um, but that's really just not the case um, for so many of the patients and you realize that the more you talk to them. Um, and it's, it's been neglected by uh, funding agencies and by the medical community, so it remains this, this really enormous medical mystery, and we're, we're looking at it for that. Um, there's millions of people suffering. Um, and now, because there's been mounting awareness, uh, in part because of some of Ron's advocacy efforts and advocacy efforts of sort of fed up patients all over the world, um, there, there is starting to become, you know, we're starting to get evidence that this is a molecular disease, um, that there are some deficits at the metabolic and immunological uh, side, and that it looks like there's probably a genetic factor. It does run in families in some cases. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to apply some of our genomics expertise to it, and that's what we've, we've been doing to, to sort of um, explore this personal connection. Um, so this is, you know, sort of a very uh, sketchy overview of what we think might be going on. Um, like I said, because so little has been done, um, many patients report an infection at the start of their illness, maybe about 70% or so. Um, and there are immunological alterations, um, pro-inflammatory cytokine signs of inflammation have been found in patients, but these are pretty, uh, pretty heterogeneous, just like this, the, the higher level symptoms. There are some metabolic deficiencies, um, and like I said, we think there's some genetic component because there's families and uh, because it, it tends to run in families. Um, so when you put all of this together, this is this is sort of our best guess that these these things all sort of interact um, to to yield uh, disease symptoms. And maybe maybe there's a threshold of some sort that the patients are pushed over where this becomes a chronic thing and not just you know your everyday sort of viral infection. Um, but we don't know. And and the the complexity part of this is that individual variation in genetics or the type of infection you get or your metabolism, which can also obviously interact with your diet, can, can contribute to many of the differences that we see across patients. This is just a sort of snapshot of some of the metabolism, uh, the metabolic deficiencies and surpluses that we see in a severely ill patient. And uh, this is the kind of data that we're getting and that we're trying to make sense of. And these you know, you were able, to, fortunately, to put these in the context of their metabolic pathways, um, but it still doesn't really tell us exactly what's going on, what's wrong with this patient, what might be able to make them better, most importantly. Um, and we're collecting hundreds of these from hundreds of patients over many different time points to try to understand the progression of the disease. And so this is where the data just becomes the bottleneck. Um, generating the data is no longer the bottleneck. It's what to do with it, how do we make sense of it. And this is where the real opportunity is for, for AI 
in genomics is pulling out the meaningful information from these enormous baffling data sets um, that are no longer a challenge to generate. The kinds of things that we can, we can get out of using AI and machine learning are things like molecular stratification of disease. Now, this has happened pretty nicely with cancer, uh, for example. We've seen, uh, we've been able to, um, to treat patients based on their genomic profiles, their gene expression. That's an example of what we'd like to be able to do with all kinds of diseases, including things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, we also are all after the holy grail of biomarkers. Uh, what biomarkers does it make sense to measure in disease? Um, what time, when, from blood, from saliva, from urine, from where? Um, and to really be able to put all of this information together to figure out how does it happen on a molecular level? How do you go from the causative path from a healthy person one day to disease, you know, the next year or something like that? Um, and mechanistic modeling and systems biology approaches are certainly playing a big role in that and really taking advantage of, of machine learning. But these are, these are some of the really big questions that we would love to be able to answer. Um, because they can lead to potential intervention points. If you know that X causes Y and Y causes the disease, well, if you can prevent X from causing Y, then you might have a therapy. And that's, that's uh, what we're trying to, to be able to identify in CFS and what people are trying to identify in all kinds of diseases. And that would hopefully then lead to in silico drug discovery and design. I know that there's a lot of companies starting to get into that space as well based on, uh, based on molecular data. So what could we realize if all of this is actually achieved? We can envision a, a future in healthcare where we are our own healthy controls, where you start off, you, you're, you're healthy, and you're the definition of what normal should be, and you just want to get back to that baseline if you ever get sick using all of this data. It's a data-driven healthcare. It's also a healthcare in which we can monitor wellness rather than just reacting to disease when it presents itself. And certainly things like wearable technology are, have great potential for that. And that's another thing that, another area that our center is working on. Um, wearable sensors, portable devices, um, implantable sensors. And we're not quite at edible yet, but we'll get there. Um, but I'm making this point to show that the technology at this point is not really the limiting factor. It's actually what do we, you're figuring out what, what do we monitor and how do we use that data in a clinical setting? Um, those are very, very open questions. So I'll close with this, a vision for, for where, where we'd like this to go, for precision health, precision medicine, personalized medicine. It's referred to as many different things. But what we can envision is a medicine where it's personalized, and that doesn't mean preventive, ideally, down the road, we'll be able to know what we personally can do to avoid contracting a disease because we have certain risks that might be greater than somebody else that uh, somebody else around us. And it's participatory. Um, the the sort of beauty of all of this is that the patients will be, or we as individuals, will be empowered by our own data to take an active role in our healthcare and and to be able to make informed decisions and work in partnership with our healthcare providers. Um, so this is where we see it going. Um, and this is, this is something that needs not only research like we're doing, um, it needs technology development to drive this forward, and it really needs a lot of machine learning and intelligent ways to use data and to extract meaning from it. So it's really got to be a collaborative effort um, between all of, these, all of these different fronts um, and with, with that, I'm just going to close and uh, talk of, and just hint at the, uh, the sort of topics that I'm hoping to, to cover during this panel discussion. Um, I'm hoping that we can talk about some of the opportunities we have at the intersection of genomics and artificial intelligence, some of the challenges that we're facing. Why hasn't it happened yet? Why are we still struggling with some of these problems? And what we, what we need to do to move forward from here to, to make all of this a reality. So thank you very much. Well, I think Rekha set up my uh, presentation pretty well, so thank you. Um, I'm Charlene San Rigby, and I'm Senior Vice President of Customer Operations at Fabric Genomics. I've spent the last 20 years developing and commercializing bioinformatics and enterprise software. 
My focus has always been on analytics, enabling users to get insight and value out of data. So I originally came into Fabric as the first commercial hire. I led the development and launch of our first offering for clinical labs a couple of years ago, and I've been driving our product roadmap. A couple of months ago, I transitioned over to lead customer operations so I can focus on that last mile, ensuring our products are successful with our customers. So as the startup on tonight's panel, I get to, spend, uh, I get to present a few slides on fabric. I wanted to start with, great. I wanted to start with what makes me passionate about genomics um, and specifically about rare disease. This is my daughter, Juno. She's turning four on Saturday. Last year, she was diagnosed with a rare disease caused by a mutation in a gene called STXBP1. This diagnosis was the outcome of a two and a half year diagnostic odyssey that started when she was missing milestones at four months old. We went through something like 30 tests in 27 months. And we kept being told, we've never seen anyone like Juno. Finally, we were able to get approval for whole exome testing. So whole exome testing is where all the genes in the coding regions of DNA are tested. Um, and they found a mutation in STXBP1. This is a known disease gene. It was discovered over nine years ago, and it's also even offered on some panel tests. And even though it's very rare, estimated prevalence of one in 91,000 people, why wasn't it identified in Juno more quickly since it's a known disease gene? So Juno had an atypical presentation. This gene was first found and is typically associated with infantile epilepsy, so seizures that um, uh, are seen in the clinic typically in newborns or in the first couple of years of life. But Juno, but Juno didn't and she still doesn't have seizures. She has significant developmental delay. She has hypotonia or low muscle tone. She has significant swallowing issues, intellectual disability, and she's almost nonverbal. She does have two words. One of them is ma, um, and the other one is more, very functional word. Um, but um, you know, she's clearly on a very different development path than, um, than my older son. So her diagnosis of STXBP1 was a very significant milestone for us and ended the diagnostic part of our odyssey. I'm not here tonight to talk to you about the emotional and psychological value of getting a diagnosis or what's next for Juno or my family. Um, that's a whole nother topic um, and talk. Um, but there's really two salient points um, that are critical here and they revolve around data. First, we are finding that patient presentation in the clinic is much more complex and heterogeneous than previously understood. Understanding this and being able to utilize it, um, this complex phenotype information is critical for this march. And so um, it's, a, it's a new name. I already talked to a couple of people tonight who recognize Omisha when I, um, when I talked to them about it. And so excited to be able to talk a little bit about our rebranding. We raised $23 million in a Series B financing in uh, 2016 that included Roche, UPMC Enterprises, Ping On Ventures, Artist Ventures, and others. We're headquartered just across the bay in Oakland, and our founders include John Stupnagel, who was a founder of Illumina, and Martin Rees. Martin is our scientific founder, and he was a lead bioinformatician who started at the dawn of genomics time um, and, uh, during the Human Genome Project. And he was working with the team at Berkeley that sequenced the Drosophila genome. And from his early work, Martin always took a computational approach to, to genomic analysis, realizing that automated computational methods were critical when dealing with millions and even billions of data points. Martin and Fabric have had a long-standing collaboration with Mark Yandel and his lab at the University of Utah. Together, our teams have collaborated on two breakthrough algorithms, VAST and Fever. Fabric is the sole commercial distributor for um, these algorithms. In terms of our customers, they span clinical and hospital labs, as well as large research institutions and country sequencing projects. 
So this slide is going to look a little familiar. Um, <laughs> so where are we? We're really at a tipping point in genomics. Um, you know, that I, uh, you obviously have seen this slide about five minutes ago. You've probably seen it many times. And, you know, really the take home message here is that the, the cost of sequencing has been falling more, um, more rapidly than um, predicted by uh, Moore's law. And, you know, now what you're seeing is that um, the cost of sequencing for a whole genome is somewhere around $1,000. And Illumina and other sequencing vendors are now talking about being able to sequence a whole genome for $100 in a few years. So, you know, this is a really huge, um, uh, huge difference in terms of the cost. And um, now sequencing also has become operationally standardized. And so now what we're starting to see is these announcements of these um, huge sequencing projects. So AstraZeneca announced a couple of months ago that they're going to be sequencing 2 million people. There are multiple country sequencing projects. So um, uh, in 2013, the UK announced one of the first uh, country sequencing programs at, with 100,000 individuals. Now there are new announcements, including the Chinese Genome Project, where they're going to sequence a couple million people. So it's possible that by 2025, there will be upwards of 100 million sequenced human genomes. So the challenge now, And what Fabric is focused on is analyzing and interpreting all of this data. So this quote from Mike Snyder on the right here from Stanford is now a couple of years old, but still very valid about the significant cost and effort on the interpretation side of the equation. So how does Fabric address this? Fabric Genomics delivers an end-to-end -end software platform for scalable genomic analysis that takes raw data coming out of the sequencer and enables rapid insight that can be used in clinical management for both hereditary disease as well as oncology. Fabric delivers a suite of computational genomic applications that span clinical as well as research applications, and we have some emerging use cases in consumer as well. It all starts with a high-performance computing platform. And I had to do this since it's the only probably non-genomics picture that you'll see tonight. <laughs> we can process whole, gen uh, whole exomes in seconds, and we can annotate whole genomes in less than 10 minutes. Through our algorithmic methods and comprehensive approach, we empower researchers and clinicians to find the proverbial needles in the genomic haystack. So to put a point on this, each of us has three to four million mutations in our genome. So that means that, for instance, Reka and I have three million differences between us. Those three million differences are what make Reka her and what make me who I am. Um, and most, but at the same time, most of those mutations are actually benign differences. And so how do we find the mutations or the variants that are important to disease, to a specific disease, either already manifest, ma manifesting in a patient or for which that patient is at risk? And how do we do this quickly and comprehensively and at scale when we're talking about 100 million plus people potentially being sequenced in the next 10 years? So clearly manual techniques don't scale. Computational methods are needed to address this challenge. Fabric's VAST and FEVER algorithms work together to provide a probabilistic ranking of mutations based on how damaging they are, as well as their relationship to phenotype. Deep, rich phenotype information is critical to this and can be provided as input so we can leverage data from electronic med medical record systems. Through the use of these algorithms and our platform, we've recently had groups report results of up to 54% disease candidate identification. And, um, and this is where the industry average is currently around 29 to 30%. So these are really meaningful results with significant patient impact. Here, I'm showing some of our customers and licensees um, to give you a sense of who's using our software, LabCorp, Intermountain, UPMC, and um, Genomics England, the NHS company who is managing the UK 100,000 Genomes Project, are some. 
I'll close with this slide on Fabric's commitment and focus, advancing bioinformatics to deliver on the promise of precision medicine. I'm looking forward to our panel discussion tonight. Thank you. So I'm uh, Helmi Oltuki, co-founder and CEO of Garden Health. Um, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's a great uh, panel. I look forward to the discussion. I'll tell you a little bit about Garden. Um, we're the market leader in liquid biopsies. We started the company about four, four and a half years ago, and we launched uh, the world's first comprehensive liquid biopsy for uh, in oncology in 2014. That test essentially helps uh, cancer patients get better treatments without the need for invasive biopsies. Uh, average biopsy in lung cancer costs about $14,000, has a 19% complication rate, and a 1% to 2% mortality rate. And so we can essentially replace that test with a you know, simple uh, blood draw. And it's pretty uh, spectacular kind of the uptake we've seen over the last couple of years. We've tested you know, now tens of thousands of patients. Um, but the nice thing is the data has really been uh, our biggest you know, asset. We've learned from every sample that we've sequenced. And you know, our idea basically was um, we could build economies of scale, both in uh, performance as well as cost. And now we're at the point where we can apply this technology towards uh, cancer survivors. There are about 16 million of them in the US that are living in fear that their cancer may come back one day. And we can essentially, hopefully, give them peace of mind with a test that can essentially give them uh, recurrence detection uh, sooner rather than later. And then we're also working on early detection with the same technology, really spanning the continuum of care. And so it's been an exciting intersection of genomics, data, and um, a lot of algorithmic uh, development, whether it's artificial intelligence and machine learning, or just um, kind of nitty-gritty data science. Great. Thank you. My name is Andy Felton. I'm VP of Marketing for Ion Torrent. And Ion Torrent is the next generation sequencing tools part of the Thermo Fisher uh, Scientific Corporation. Thermo Fisher is a very large entity now. There's about 55,000 people. The group I'm in is a relatively small part of the smaller part of the business. And um, we are the, uh, I would say, the counterweight to uh, Illumina. Uh, in the world of uh, next generation sequencing. So our mission, we were uh, a startup seven years ago. I was part of that startup group uh, that was uh, founded by Jonathan Rothberg. It took us about three or four years to get the technology to market based on a semiconductor technology um, out of a standard CMOS foundry. Uh, so the same technology that's in your iPhone camera is what we use to detect the sequence information. After seven years, what we've uh, realized as part of being in the genomics tool space is you, you have to find the relevant uh, part of the market that you can play in. So the part of the market that we're playing, somewhat similar to Helmi and uh, uh, his work, is in, uh, primarily in oncology. Although we are a generic sequencing tools provider, we've decided to focus our efforts over the last three or four years on the oncology market in general. And we offer a set of tools for um, the clinicians out there to analyze cancer patients, both for the mutations, their primary mutations, uh, moving into areas like liquid biopsy. So we'll be in friendly uh, competition, or maybe not quite so friendly, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but friendly right now. Anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, immuno-oncology, those of you who are following the oncology space will know that the immuno-oncology area is a tremendously exciting opportunity, uh, potential for long-lasting, durable cures. Uh, part of that space will inquire sequencing some very different parts of the genome, including the immune repertoire. Whereas the, the main part of the genome that you hear about is very static, it doesn't really change much throughout your life. Uh, the repertoire of your immune system changes in response to various factors, what you're doing, your exercise levels, your eating, your habits, and that will be completely dynamic over your lifetime. And sequencing that level of information, just to give you a sense of how big that is, there are 10 to the 13 different copies of clones in your immune repertoire. That level of information is going to be, require enormous computing power to manage and just uh, delve into the understanding of the, the human genome and how we respond. And that's one of the areas that we're trying to look at and uh, develop tool sets for. So it's an exciting time, uh, hopefully an exciting area, and uh, lots of things to do for the future. 
Oh, thanks, Andy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Urshit Parekh. I'm uh, one of the partners at the Mayfield Fund. Uh, Mayfield is one of the oldest uh, anchor venture capital firms of Silicon Valley. Uh, it's almost 50 years old. Uh, we do early stage Series A, Series B investing in a wide spectrum of areas, uh, from um, you know stuff in consumer like Lyft to uh, a lot of things these days in health tech and bioengineering. Uh, the firm has a great legacy in this domain. Uh, it was the, the founding investor in firms like Amgen, Genentech, uh, Intuitive Surgical. Um, and uh, you know, these days uh, our focus area is really sort of in two broad spaces when I look at this area. Uh, the first is that we believe that uh, uh, sort of precision platforms are going to be a big enabler that truly delivers sort of personalized care. And uh, we take a broad based view on it. So in our view, it's not just about precision medicine. There's, you know, there's some conversation about precision diagnostics. There's also precision care delivery in the healthcare system. And one area that uh, doesn't get spoken about a lot is really what we call precision wellness. Um, and I'll take a little sort of two minute segue kind of to explain that part of the perspective. But if I have something which is a new precision medicine or a precision cure, the way it goes to a consumer who needs it is that I actually have to create it. I have to prove its efficacy and safety. I have to get an FDA approval for it. I have to work uh, with the AMA to get a CPT code created for it. I have to convince the payers to reimburse it. Then I have to convince doctors to prescribe it. And then a patient uh, has to be educated to ask the doctor for it before they really get it. Um, you know, for a lot of the precision things, you could actually enable uh, uh, some sort of a direct-to-consumer path with high engagement. And if you are able to then show that you could actually reduce cost or risk or improve wellness, then you may find risk-bearing entries like self-insured employers actually enable uh, and reimburse for that sort of right off the bat. And, and then the data that kind of gets collected from an approach like that can be used in a bunch of other means uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so that's, so that's broadly precision. The other area that we like to invest in um, is that we feel that the overall experience that the people have with healthcare or what some people call the sick care system or the overall wellness kind of uh, ecosystem is really stuck to 80s and 90s, uh, while you know, user expectations have evolved quite significantly. And so for emerging companies, when you have really high consumer engagement health and wellness services, that can still be reimbursed through the existing ecosystem. Uh, you can actually build some pretty amazing companies. That's, that's one of the things that we end up sort of believing in it. Uh, I've been at Mayfield for four years. Most of my career has been as an entrepreneur and an operator. Um, and um, uh, you know, glad to be here this evening. Great. OK, thank you all. Um, so for the, the first segment of this, um, we're just going to have a discussion up here. And then we'll, we'll invite some audience questions uh, via Twitter, et cetera. <laughs> Um, so one question I, I would I would start um, with all of you is is how do you how have you decided um, in your companies or in your in your venture firm how, um, which area of genomics is most attractive to, for you to work in or how do you make changing decisions what what becomes more more feasible or more more marketable or more sexy or how do you make those decisions I'm starting provocative sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could go first on that. Sure. Uh, so I think while there's never been a better time to be um, a health tech or a bioengineering entrepreneur, I think it is one of the hardest areas of entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and I could kind of go into a lot of reasons on why it is a hard area to kind of be in. But the question is less about why we don't invest. It's more about what we look for when we invest. Mm -hmm. And there's four key factors that we look for. I think the first ends up being, um, is this entrepreneurial team solving a very hard problem? And is their solution approach such that it will actually, as they are in the market longer, their solution will get better over time? Um, so that when they have lookalike competition, the segment doesn't sort of fully get commoditized. Um, and so these advantages can kind of come from, you know, data, network effects, uh, just, just brand reputation, uh, you know, distribution, lock-in, what, whatever those factors may be. Um, so that's, that's clearly one. I think the second is that, is this company um, really looking to kind of deliver an awesome, do they know who the user is? And are they going to be able to truly engage that user and sustainably change their behavior over time? Or, or users are going to be. So this could be a consumer, a patient, a doctor, a nurse, uh, you know, uh, a researcher, whoever. Uh, but at the same time, while they have to be great about knowing the users and consumers, we also look for whether they have a good understanding of the ecosystem that is going to be navigated to actually build a high velocity revenue business. 
Um, and so in other words, do they really understand the commercials or are they great sort of enterprise entrepreneurs? And then finally, what we look at in this domain is that is this, um, you know, anything that you look in healthcare, it's 20% of the US GDP, it's a very big market, tends to be very crowded. You just have to pick any niche area and go into a conference and you find that most of them will be larger than I see. There are a lot of people here who are sort of from pure tech backgrounds, like someone bigger than the biggest tech conferences. And so we look for um, sort of teams that will really think about sort of their project as a mission and kind of create a platform that attracts great people, customers, entrepreneurs, um, you know, employees, and really can run an industry conversation to define a category and then kind of, uh, you know, um, be in the category for the long haul, um, you know, attract a lot of the right financing, things like that. So, so this ends up sort of being kind of the broader lens. And uh, I think, uh, it's very hard to find all of these things in, in sort of one core team, but that's, uh, uh, but I think when you have all of those examples, you see that, you know, uh, real change happens and the mission that an entrepreneur started out a company with uh, truly sort of can get realized. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I'll jump in uh, kind of from the entrepreneur's kind of uh, perspective. Uh, you know, we think of um, utility versus information. And I think um, often there's a conflation between utility and information where um, you know, we can sequence people's genomes, you know, we can do whole exomes and so on, and, you know, sometimes there are great, you know, results like that, but more often than not, um, most people who have their genome sequenced are told they have a boring uh, genome, I mean, and so maybe one, I wanted to kind of uh, do a little survey here, and how many people have had a 23andMe test? And Okay, so good. Uh, oh, this yeah. Silicon Valley after all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, germline sequencing for BRCA? Yeah, much fewer. And then how about whole genome sequencing? Just a handful. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's that's I think a good uh, representation of the divide. You know, especially from a business perspective of you know utility is that. You know, there's things that are scientifically really exciting, you know, at the forefront, we can publish papers in Nature and so on, but actually making a business out of it, we look at two axes, personal utility and clinical utility. And at the end of the day, you're, you're selling something, and so there has to be a decision impact, there has to be an impact on that end user. And so the way we think about it in terms of which areas we invest in, um, are, are our next products going to improve outcomes and lower cost? And then if we have those two things, we know that you know, we're hitting, we're at least starting at the right um, you know, starting point. Obviously, there's a lot of work that has to you know, go, uh, go you know, beyond that to get that product into the market. There's reimbursement and regulatory and a whole bunch of other things that I won't get into, into much detail here. But um, you know, it's, it's just important to understand you know, really the differences between um, those two aspects, utility and information. I'll speak. Okay. Sorry. Go. Okay. Um, I'll speak from another entrepreneurial um, standpoint. So I definitely agree with the points that Helmi made around you really need to look at um, you know, the, the market and you know, kind of where the opportunities are. The other thing that you know, we looked at um, very closely within our company was what was our core competency and what were the assets that we had. And so um, you know, in terms of one of our key collaborations as an example, um, the Utah has, um, you know, because of the Mormon population and these really, really significant, well-documented pedigrees, they had um, this population that we could leverage and a um, and a, a nascent genome project mm -hmm. at the um, at that time several years ago, and so that was something that we thought, okay, we have this core competency around algorithm development and have developed some IP. This is a great population for us to be able to kind of test and leverage. And as we continue to kind of evaluate new opportunities in the market and add to our platform, you know, that's something that we look at is what's the synergy with what we have in terms of our competencies and how can we kind of leverage partnerships in the marketplace to extend that. Yeah, it's so all great points. I think the points I would make from our side, you know, just diving back into the history of coming from a startup to, you know, in the hundred millions of dollars of revenue. When we started the company, the idea was to obviously to be disruptive. And to be disruptive, you have to change the paradigm that you're in at the, at the time. And the, the paradigm at the time in genomics was you had two technology bases. 
uh, the applied biosystems capital resequencing platforms, which were the backbone of the human genome project. And then there was the relatively new at the time Illumina Corporation, who had a very large, very high throughput system, but it cost $750,000. So our mission that we set ourselves was to build a system that could go on the bench top of the scientist and do something equating to what Illumina was doing at the time to change the paradigm. So you have to pick a market that you really can, you see the need and you have the technology base that you can leverage to deliver something that truly changes it. So the beverage bed scientists couldn't get access to the technology. That's what we wanted to build. Once we built it uh, and we used, you know, at that point we got sold to a large corporation. So we had, you know, much more marketing budget available to go into the market and deliver that capability and support it in the market. Then it's, you know, what is your segment that you're going to try and capture? So originally we went after the research segment because that was where the market was. And over time that evolved to uh, primarily for us the oncology market because that's where we saw the sexy growth area coming from. Sustained revenue uh, from building a solution that actually leverages the spending on the healthcare uh, that this company and the, the Western European countries spend as well as now in uh, China and other Asia and other markets. Mm -hmm. So that was the way we did it. Okay, thank you. Um, Charlene, I actually wanted to follow up with you. When you were, when you were presenting, it looked like uh, a lot of what you were focusing on are rare diseases or <coughs> Mendelian diseases where you're only kind of looking for mm -hmm. one variant that's doing something. Are, are, y are you looking into, uh, at your company, complex diseases? And this, um, I mean, the rest of you are also welcome to comment on this. And how do, we, how do we start to bring in things like AI and machine learning when we, so some of you might be familiar with a recent study that just came out of Stanford proposing an omnigenic model for, for diseases. So not only do we have multiple genetic variants that might be contributing to a complex disease, but their proposal is that almost any of them could, if you consider all of the um, interactors in a genetic network, and that those could impinge on any disease process. Um, so that's where things like machine learning and artificial intelligence become very important. So I guess the question is, how do you, how do you plan to confront those kinds of challenges? Um, or do you? Um, what's, what's the sort of relative weight that you might be giving them in, in your business or in businesses that you might be investing in? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of the um, cases that we have um, you know, gone through and really focused on initially were the Mendelian diseases. You know, those are easier than my daughter's example, you know, single variant, um, high penetrance disease. Mm -hmm. um, but our algorithms um, and platform can definitely be applied to complex disease. We're doing a lot right now in cardiovascular mm -hmm. in, this, um, in this area. Um, and, you know, we really see that, you know, that's where kind of the next wave is going because, you know, rare disease is rare. <laughs> so, um, you know, so even though... But certainly there's a lot you can learn. Yes, there. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So there is a lot that you can learn. And even mm. though there are what we're now finding very many rare diseases, you know, just in terms of the size of the market, clearly, you know, an area like cardiovascular and some of the chronic diseases, um, Crohn's disease, um, these are definitely areas that, um, you know, we are, um, you know, working on in terms of our technology being able to address and um, our uh, algorithms that I talked about tonight, back and fever actually do um, have applications in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a comment on that, uh, the omnigenic model, because I think that that's really very interesting because it's taking it on, you know, kind of almost to the nth degree where I think that the example in that, um, uh, that uh, study was around um, height and that they mm -hmm. think that there could be even 100,000 variants that contribute to it. Right. And, uh, each contributing like you know some percent of a milli uh, millimeter, and I'm five feet tall, <laughs> and I feel like I must have really drawn the bad <laughs> straws in that a hundred thousand times. Yes, a hundred thousand times. But I mean, I think it is very interesting because you know there you clearly see that you have to have algorithmic methods. So even mm -hmm. you know even if that um, you know, that um, hypothesis is only half true, mm -hmm. um, there's no way that you can look at that data without some sort of um, you know AI or machine learning technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Sure. I, I would say, you know, for, for an established, speaking as the established company, uh, that's a hard problem for us to tackle. Um, it, it, it's very complicated. It probably involves many layers of the genome, methylation, RNA, immune repertoire. 
yep. stitching all those pieces of information together. Um, would we focus on that as a, you know, a development effort? More, probably not. Extremely challenging for us. It's, it's hard to see where you would get a return on your investment for that kind of research. I think you know, we, if there was basic research out there that had come to a solution on that one, and there was a defined specific solution that we could commercialize, we would probably think about it. But I'm not sure how we would tackle that right now as a commercial entity. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, can, I can talk about our efforts there. So we announced uh, last month an uh, you know, initiative to sequence a million cancer patients within the next five years. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that when we think about our goal for early detection, and I would say this um, really um, applies to almost any disease, precise diagnosis in any disease, is that um, specificity has been the Achilles heel, clinical specificity. And so a lot of these common diseases are really tens of thousands of rare diseases that you know, we kind of artificially group together. And that's where in healthcare we are very data starved. Um, in general, I know we can produce a lot of data very quickly, but even that data is only scratching the surface in terms of what's actually necessary in a focused um, area of, of disease. And not only do we need the information, um, you know, underlying molecular information, and I think Andy points out very rightly that our whole concept of a whole genome today, I think, is, is going gonna, is gonna to be laughable in a few years because there's all these different layers of regulation. We are multicellular organisms. You know, it's not going to be a single whole genome. It's dynamic. It changes over time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and right now, whole genomes are pretty ground beef genomes. You get Guess what? 90% of it is but what causes genome, like a lot of disease in autoimmune or cancer site, mm -hmm. is actually accumulation of mutations and when several of these mutations kind of happen together. Yes. So I would so far as to sort of go out on a limb and say that I think the crystal ball is not actually going to be uh, if I was to say five years out or ten years out, what is going to be the nature of precision medicine when you go to a doctor? It is less going to be about let me go and get these, you know, microbiome and exome and exposome and all, all of that stuff done. And it is going to be much more about here's a set of drugs that are in the market. They're through the clinical trial process. Uh, they actually evaluated what was happening to a user, you know, a patient's genome. Uh, both to see whether the early warning of the disease or the cure, cure of the disease. And, and, and that because you need a certain level of constant specificity to actually take things through the, the FDA approval process mm -hmm. and some level of repeatability and consistency because the, the other challenge that we find in a lot of the genomics and testing and sort of papers and all of that stuff like that is you know, you're not really able to reproduce that well. So you need that specificity and consistency to actually be able to prescribe medicine with a certain level of confidence. So I would go out on the limb and say that while there's going to be these 20, 30, 40 data sources, uh, I think this promise is probably going to get fulfilled over the next 50 years, but in the next 10 year time frame, we're probably going to find a, some level of gene and some level of gene expression become the basis by which a lot of the prescriptions will happen. Yeah, that's a very interesting take on it. Yeah. Um, and you actually set up the follow-up question that I was going to, <laughs> going to ask Kalmi. So you're looking at cancer, which is a disease of the genome, and obviously an excellent opportunity for diagnostics in the genome space, what would it take for you to move to a different kind of a disease, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, for example? But I was telling, you know, others that... Uh, One is establishing, I think, you know, what Helmi said is, you know, establishing the clinical specificity of a particular test, right? So you have to have a cohort of patients that's large enough that you can accumulate information to know that your result is really, truly actionable. And those are normally done through clinical trials processes today with, you know, collaborated groups that you have, you know, accumulate that information, analyze it informatically. I think once you have that information, you know, you can design a test, we can design a test pretty easily that will be specific. Getting that to patients involves two parts. One is you deliver it to the network of clinicians and, you know, if it's oncology, it's pathologists who administer those tests. The second one is can you get enough people to adopt it? And the third one is can you eventually bring it through the FDA approval process? And that's no mean task. We, you know, we just went through a class three PMA submission with the FDA and that's a $50 million process with a stack of documents on four pallets wide. So it's not to be undertaken lightly, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. 
I would say regulatory is also um, a challenge for us. So we are not a clinical lab, and we are not um, uh, uh, marketing an assay, um, but our customers are clinical labs. And so the uptake of our software and the volume that our customers are going to generate is directly related to what's happening from a regulatory and a reimbursement standpoint. And so you know, I think two issues um, that we see in the market. One is in terms of the reimbursement. So you know, CMS has been um, you know, promising that there are going to be new uh, reimbursement codes and that there will be a reimbursement associated with those. That process has not happened as quickly as um, I think anyone would be hoping it would happen. Um, but I think the positive news there is that you know, there have been codes that have been tr introduced recently um, for you know, whole exome, which is, you know, didn't exist before at all. So that's, mm -hmm. that is um, promising. Um, and then you know, the, second, the second piece has been that there has actually been, I would say, kind of a, a cloud around you know, how much the FDA was going to um, regulate clinical labs, and um, you know, it seems like the most recent direction has been that there's going to be a, um, uh, I would say, a balanced approach to it, but that has also definitely, I think, impacted clinical lab um, uptake. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can, say, I can um, say that regulatory for us, I think, has been fairly straightforward. Obviously, there are you know, challenges, but at least if you know kind of what's expected, it's much more predictable, I would say. Reimbursement is obviously the, the biggest challenge, I would say, for, I would argue, ultimately, even for the, you know, the tools, you know, side, and in some, in some respects, in terms of, you know, the, all these hospitals, you know, whoever the end user is of these products, eventually, if they're not getting paid for running these tests, it's not, you know, self-sustaining, it's not going to grow to where everyone is, you know, sequenced at birth, or where, you know, everyone is sequenced for a certain disease state, and so I would say, Reimbursement is a big challenge for the, the healthcare field in general. And the challenge with that is there are hundreds of different payers in the United States, and they all have different um, thresholds in terms of when and when they, they won't pay for tests. And so it's, it's a very, um, I'd say, opaque you know, process in terms of you know, going through that. And it's a multi-year process. You know. um, the second area where I, th I would say is challenging is um, Clinical adoption, I think, is the one of the it, the time constant associated with clinical adoption is much slower than one would think. I think there was a study that um, estimated that it, the the half life or the the it's about fifty percent of physicians adopt a new technique. It, it takes about seven years for that to happen. Yep. And so, um, I'll give you an example from our space where uh, the NCCN guidelines for lung cancer only have seven genomic markers that are mentioned. That's seven out of, you know, potentially hundreds that people, you know, look at. Yet, um, those seven are only tested in about 8% of patients, of lung cancer patients. And the, and the top one, which has been around for almost a decade, um, is only tested in about 65% of patients. And so, you know, we can argue about, you know, large genomes and, you know, doing a lot of, a lot of data, but even the, the basic stuff um, which is, you know, dictated in this kind of the standard of care in terms of guidelines is not necessarily being practiced at, you know, 100% of uh, clinics in, in the U.S. right now. Yeah. And that's so even by the time it gets to be recommended as part of yeah, the guidelines. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. That's something that we've come up against in the, um, from the research side of trying to enable yeah. genomics in medicine, too, is that the medical community is has been quite resistant and there are, and Leroy Hood, who's, uh, who's credited with the P4 medicine concept that I presented earlier, has said the medical education, um, changing that will probably be even greater than the scientific challenges that we face in, in <laughs> making this and, happen. And so I think the, the, the challenges that helped me suggest, I right, put them in this bucket of like the user is not the payer. And I think a lot of the challenges that we have in the existing system yeah. is the fact that you know, we almost have a very patriarchal attitude towards users, patients, and consumers saying, we know better than you, right? I, as a payer, know better than you. I, as a doctor, know better than you. I, as a nurse, know better than you. And I think one of the things that the tools of precision medicine enable is actually going to be easier sort of self-discovery. So this is why, you know, when I say, if you are able to take whatever your solution is and a subset of it, and actually find a way to engage consumers on it, 
and then find a way for either them to want to pay, right? You can get, you know, on precision wellness, you could almost think of a next gen sort of weight watchers, which is going to do a precision diet and kind of, kind of do that, but you collect the data. Or you can kind of have employers who basically want to kind of ensure that people are not getting overprescribed, kind of pay for it. So, so I think that this, this reimbursement thing is, will be a real challenge in how we empower consumers mm -hmm. uh, and make things easy for them. And clearly there isn't going to be enough people to kind of do genetic counseling and all of that stuff like that, right? So AI applied into sort of just as you have AI bots for a whole range of things, genetic counseling is going to be one of the areas where we'll, we'll see a big AI bot emerge. I think the second area that I think is that if we look at the funding landscape, um, you really have this bucket of haves and have nots. You have a very small subset of companies which are able to raise a lot of money because there's a certain vision and a certain thing and then you almost have this, you know, herd of investors kind of go after that. But then there are very large swaths of opportunity where people are not able to raise money sufficiently well. And I think part of the challenge is that this is such a technical multiple multidisciplinary space where I think frankly not enough investors are actually there doing a lot of the groundwork to think through the what should be the right investment strategies. And so I think we do need more investors uh, around this domain who are willing to do the work uh, for the deeper sort of, uh, you know, a lot of the investors don't want to take science risk, but even on sort of the product or the engineering risk side of the house. And I think that is one of the big challenges that will sort of slow down what I would, what you would call sort of rare diseases or things like that. And it, I mean, I think the opportunity is there, but it's, it's really, um, you know, bandwidth on, on sort of technical investment decisions. Well, I think we can all agree that more investment in all of this would be great. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, uh, that leads in, um, so we were talking about sort of practical challenges. Um, can you talk about some of the ethical challenges that, that you have faced with your company or that you think that you might be coming up against soon enough? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I can think of one right now for us. Um, one of the kind of big trends in the genomic space is, is aggregation of data. So y you can particularly with the cloud availability now. So we have a cloud offering and we have you know, about 100,000 data points a year entered into the cloud, but we don't get to utilize that in aggregate because each person owns that, each group owns that data. So the question, the ethical questions are, you know, can you put in a framework that would allow you to aggregate that genomic data in a sense to, to mine it and utilize the information to either design a new test or improve the test that you have uh, in a way that doesn't compromise you know, patient integrity um, because obviously any genomic information potentially is relatable back directly to a patient in some fashion or other. Mm -hmm. So that, those are really difficult both legal and ethical challenges for how you do it. We can all see the benefits of having these massive data sets but actually designing your legal construct and ethical construct to take advantage of it in a, in a fashion that will be acceptable to the community is, is a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm actually quite optimistic about how we will collectively deal with the, the legal and the ethical challenge as well. And right now it's used more as a red herring issue. Uh, I think overall in the healthcare system, we are all kind of coming to a point where there is no discrimination for uh, you know, pre-existing conditions or pre-existing health conditions, right? Your gene you're is, right. so, so um, it, it'll stay in some variant shape or form. People have to get elected, so it's hard to take away stuff that, that a lot of people like. Again, I'm going out on limb making a prediction. Could, could very well be wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, think, I think with that kind of a framework in place, uh, then the question really starts coming down to, you know, uh, what can you do with regards to things like gene editing, you know, stem cell therapies. Uh, and, and I think there, I think, uh, what is beginning to happen and, and we are increasingly seeing more clinical trials happening for stem cell therapies in the US where the therapies were actually developed in like Korea and China and things like that. You can kind of correlate that to what was happening in the, on the research front during the George Bush years. Uh, so, so we may just end up seeing the frontier kind of coming from some of the other areas and we'll probably be able to learn that. And then I think the final third area is uh, everybody currently is in this data holding mode. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a lot of enablement that is happening for users to be able to eventually own their medical records and then decide who they want to give it to. 
Um, and so this is one of the areas where we can take and see what happened as the inspiration from the classic tech side of the house, where if you rolled out 10, 20 years ago, every tech company was trying to do their own systems, own memory management, own thing, and then you had a collective commons and open source kind of emerge. And so I think a lot of the health condition data is going to be like that, and, mm -hmm. and over time will we'll kind of move, move in that direction. So anybody who is kind of sitting on this health data is, in my opinion, sitting on a temporary near-term advantage. So I think the, the broader direction is headed in the right direction. That sets up a good question that we can, that we can kind of go from, is the interaction with electronic health records, medical records, and this should be making things easier, but um, are any of you willing to share your experiences in that and, and how, how maybe things might need to change to be able to better incorporate genomic information into those? So I can um, speak to um, you know, some of the experiences that we've had with, um, with some of our clients. So uh, I think I mentioned during my um, introductory remarks that phenotype, phenotype information, especially deep phenotype information, is really important to accurate diagnosis. Um, and we leverage that data within our algorithms. Um, what we have been finding is that you know, the EMR should be a great resource um, for being able to pull in that information, but you know, EMRs weren't originally you know, more designed as data capture systems versus um, with this concept of having structured data um, that could be pulled from them. And so what um, you know, we have found through the projects that we have been um, engaged in with our uh, clinical labs is that the, um, the data is often in notes so it's in these you know, fields that really can't be very easily mined. And um, with one um, customer that we were working with, uh, where they were trying to get multiple hospitals up and running, they had thought, great, they have these EMR systems. They'll be able to automatically pull this data out and um, be able to feed it in um, automatically with all of the genomic data that they were sending us. They had to um, basically take uh, two months with a set of medical students and have them go back into the EMR manually for each of those patients to be able to then pull out the relevant information because it was just basically not mineable. And so what um, you know, we see that I'm actually very excited about is that a lot of um, you know, healthcare systems are now investing in these um, you know, data warehouses and data lakes to be able to aggregate this information um, you know, so it is mineable. But you know, it's, it's definitely not an easy task because you're trying to deal with a lot of historic information, longitudinal information, um, information that's you know, varied in terms of you know, test results, um, uh, you know, uh, doctor information that you know about the patient presentation in the clinic. So um, I think this is really critical because this aggregation is going to be required if we can apply, in order for us to apply computational techniques to it. But it's definitely a huge undertaking. For I mean, there's, I agree. I mean, there's a running joke. You know, once you've integrated with one EMR, you've integrated with one EMR. And so <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's, and that that's definitely you know that's actually even worse than that because. You know, um, the EMR is usually one stack of many layers that these hospital systems have. They have the practice management system. A lot of the radiographic imaging is not, you know, um, accessible from, you know, their EMR. And they have, you know, m m many other layers as well. And so um, not only is the data often, you know, very unstructured, there's often maybe not the follow-up that you need because of maybe the patients, once they're doing well, they actually don't come back or they go to another um, center close to home. And so there's this illusion of like all this fantastic data, I think, in all these different EMRs. And some of it is, is good data, but it's definitely not, um, you know, just being stuck. It's not, you know, these rubies and uh, gold and, and this kind of, you know, this treasure chest that you just have to find the, you know, kind of key to, to discovering and then opening up. And so there's a lot of work in terms of actually integrating, integrating in multiple layers, integrating with all these different hospitals. And so... And we find that, you know, I think we have to do a lot of structured studies and we have to think about the patient piece um, often in terms of actually acquiring that data. We think the patient will be key to um, both um, more accurate generation of that data, faster generation of that data, and faster uptake of new technologies. So I, I think it's one of the best opportunities for AI. Uh, so two things. First, everybody hates the EMR. 
but <laughs> without the EMR we won't really be having a real, you know if you go back 2008 right the uh, uh, a lot of what enabled the EMR penetration to actually get to 90 plus percent of the health systems was actually part of the stimulus packages that went out in 2008. So before that we didn't have any of these things digitized at all, now we at least have these things online. Uh, I think AI is very well set up to actually go look at doctor's notes, look at these things, do the error correction, all of that stuff like that. Uh, and so I actually think if it wasn't for the EMR, it would be very hard to do new companies in this space. Because now for the first time you have this information that's online, now you can apply a lot more of the software computing sciences to a lot of the life sciences questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think what I encourage startups to think of is, uh, you know, find a way to essentially get a business associates agreement with your customers if the customers are hospital systems because then you will get basically full access to that data um, and, and you can actually do a lot. Uh, the integration challenges are the ones that are there for real but I think that's one of the few things that Silicon Valley has a lot of talent on and how you can kind of go deal with that data. That's, that's a problem that's not just unique to healthcare, that's a problem that is there. You can go to any Fortune 500 corporation and they'll complain about how their customer data is distributed in 5,000 databases. So, um, so I think, I think that, that actually becomes a good opportunity for emerging companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and, and if you were to use that classic tech sort of analogy, uh, you know you had Oracle and SAP and they were these products that enterprises, enterprise users hated because they were really the system of record uh, where information was captured but they were not very user friendly. And so if you've seen what has happened in enterprise software, you've seen this notion of a system of engagement. Uh, this is where you see companies like Salesforce and for each vertical area, solutions that actually users use on a day to day basis to do their jobs. And then there's a next layer powered by AI that is coming up which you would call the system of action, which is essentially something that either does things for you or, or makes the right suggestions or recommendations uh, for you to be able to kind of do or get the results that you want. It's, it's one of those things where stuff gets presented to you that, that you didn't even know you needed. But the system was smart enough to anticipate that and deliver that for you. So I think the, the opportunities are for the system of record and the system of engagement in healthcare. And uh, I'll just add one slightly tangential point. I think if you look to the clinician and ask them what they need, not, not just the information in the electronic medical record, what they need to help the patient actually get a result is a, a translation across multiple technologies of the information that they have to give a result to that patient on. So uh, just using the oncology space, because that's the one we know well, you've got genomics, you've got immunohistochemistry, you've got various other kinds of information that they have to aggregate to come up with uh, a solution for that particular patient. That in itself is a, a problem that needs to be solved and then can be mined by artificial intelligence and probably is a nearer term problem even than, yes. than the EMR integration. Sure. That's a good point. Um, so I'm guessing that we have many budding or active entrepreneurs in the audience and I wonder what uh, all of you who have been through the process might have as advice to offer um, to them if they're trying to get into the genomic space. Where, where might they get tripped up? Um, where might be the good opportunities to look at? I'd say painkillers, not vitamins, right? I mean, what has happened <laughs> is, um, you, know, you, you know, we touched upon the specificity point, but, you know, there used to be the horoscope that people could look at, right? Whether you're Aquarius or Capricorn and what's your day going to look like. Now you can get the same thing when you go to your 23 and Me profile, right? <laughs> and you have 10% chance of this or 15 I mean, it's got to be made. It, you, it's can, good. you can date based on your genome nowadays too. Right? Right? <laughs> and, and, and so I think uh, stuff that is going to actually solve real problems. Uh, and the real problem doesn't have to be a cure for X, Y, and Z. Uh, know your user in this ecosystem and see how you can truly sort of just delight them and then find a way, uh, once you've delighted them and you can show the value, then you know how you can kind of go and, and sort of monetize that part of it out. Because I think um, the, the ground reality is that the only way you can realize your vision of what you want to achieve with the scientific or the engineering work that you're doing is if you can really get it grounded in sort of solid commercials. Uh, and, uh, and typically when people give you bad feedback, uh, you can either think that they are just full of it and, and let it go, or you can probably sort of uh, get into a mode of truly understanding 
maybe there's a certain element of truth into it or not, right? Because in general, it's very hard for people to give anybody bad feedback. It's just easier to agree, smile, nod. Um, but, but you have to really proactively seek out sort of that, that, can, that, that kind of feedback. Uh, so I think those would be two things. Well, that's good. That means that scientists would be probably be good at it because we're used to bad feedback and bad results. <laughs> 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 I would just like, I think mine is very, uh, kind of feeds off that, and it's what I said before. It's really just think about the value proposition and not the value proposition maybe in Silicon Valley, but, you know, in middle America and so on is mm -hmm. what is the, you know, utility over information, right? It's, it's you know, is, would, would the average, you know, end user that you envision truly, you know, buy your test or, you know, buy your product or, or whatever it is? And I think that's pretty universal, whatever field. Um, you're in. We often got, I think, you know, tripped up early on by talking with, you know, top physicians and, you know, physicians at, you know, NCCN centers or those in, you know, Silicon Valley and so on because it, um, you know, it's, it, 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 they, those places don't reflect, you know, 85% of, you know, oncology or where, you know, most patients are being treated in the community, completely different workflow than, you know, in, uh, you know, the these these NCCN centers or academic centers. So it's it's really really do the the research in terms of knowing your target audience. I, very similar to to both answers, right? You have to pick a, a problem that you know has value for the community to solve, and you have to remain very focused on it, and you have to drive that segment or drive that answer the way that you want to go. I think we, you know, got tripped up in our journey by trying to. Two, to have too broad uh, a product portfolio. So you have to hone down to what is it that you think you can really win at and have a value proposition to take to the market. I was just going to ask for war stories, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Charlene, anything yeah, I, I mean, I would say something very similar. Um, I think it's important to have an outside in and an inside out view. And so know what your core competencies are and what you know, assets that you have as a company and then match those to you know, what is in the marketplace. Because I think that what I see is that there are, always, uh, there are a lot of companies that have a really, really cool technology, but they're not really solving a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, at the same time, you can have found a really, really great market space that has real challenges, but you know, what are you doing that's really delivering value, um, mm -hmm. that's changing the game? Mm -hmm. there. Okay, great. Well, we're we're almost at the end of our time. I want to I want to give everybody a chance for some sort of closing statements. Um, so, as you make your closing statements, um, I would ask you to touch on one or more of the following. Um, any, um, you know, where you see the future of uh, of genomics going in terms of both the companies that you're involved with now and in terms of the overall industry. Um, what do you think are the, is the way through the challenges that you've described, um, that many, many of you have described? Um, and, uh, and how would that, I'm trying to tie in several questions from the audience here since we didn't have time to get into everything, so I'm hoping we can, uh, we can at least touch on them. And, and would, you, would you say that there's, it's much more important to generate more data versus learn ways to make sense, more ways to make sense of the data that we already have. Um, how would you r r rank those two things, or weight those two things against each other? So um, feel free to address any or all of those <laughs> in your closing remark. Uh, so a couple of the themes that, that I think kind of are about the future. I think the first is uh, we are at this very interesting phase where biology becomes technology. So while most of the discussion today was really talking about genomics and biology as it applies to human health, um, I think advances in genomics are going to actually impact agriculture, you know, materials, pretty much, you know, energy. Um, so it's it's a much wider, broader spectrum, and and I, and I think so. So I think that's that's one one sort of takeaway. Uh, in terms of uh, you know data, I think that. Right now, the quality of data that we get is pretty bad, and so I think there is a real opportunity actually in tools and like what do you create? You know, you know, one of the companies we've invested in is a single cell DNA sequencing. Because if I'm a doctor and I, so we all have to recognize that most users of solutions over here, be it doctors or, 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 or patients, are not technologists, right? 
So you can't expect them to be analysts. You can't show them graphs. You can't give them probabilities. You have to tell them yes, no, or do this now, right? That's, that's what, because in, inherently people who kind of get into the business of providing care are really caregivers. I mean, you know, so, and, and they are dealing with lots of crises all the time. Um, and, and so that, that kind of naturally translates down to how do you kind of make information more specific. And I think while we can kind of generate a lot more information and do all kinds of analysis, I think, you know, there is, better, there is a big unsolved problem on just giving more precise information. So, it, you know, I'm putting this sample. Don't tell me how much of my DNA is like home and then what are the mutations that are there. Tell me on a poor cell basis which mutations are there so that I can know how do I prescribe something upfront right, right, right in the beginning, right? So I think, I think to me that's the future where what is going to happen is that you, you are going to have that specificity. And just as, um, you know, semiconductors uh, power everything, I think we're going to see, you know, gene and genomics technology power a lot of things. Yeah, I'd say it's a, it, it's a phenomenally exciting time. If you think back 15 years, you know, we had very little genomic information at all. Um, the first human genome, you know, people wondered why we spent the money on that. You look at the, the yeah. industry that's built today, 15 years later, and we have, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollar companies based on this. So the, the potential is enormous. More data is always going to be more useful. If you think about any scientific discipline that you can think of, more data accumulation allows you to draw better conclusions and draw inferences and design new products and base those new products on that information you develop. So I don't see the pace lessening unless we <laughs> cut the NHS, NIH funding to nothing, which would be a bad thing. Please, my yeah. heart. I'm hoping we don't decide to do that. Um, but yeah, I think you know, we would definitely advocate you know, more information is better better tools to analyze that and infer conclusions from that data are only going to be more relevant as we go forward. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the way we think about you know, our iteration is about cycles of learning and engineering by training and it's about the time constant of going from hypothesis to conclusion and back again. And you know, from the semiconductor industry, there was this really nice feedback loop where you got to better technology nodes, and then you could build you know, more powerful CPUs, build better simulation and EDA software, and then build better chips. You know. and, and so there's this nice um, kind of symbiotic relationship between the tools and the, the hardware and, and the, the fruits of the, the tools. And so when we talk about you know, if you have you know, too much data but not enough you know, analytic tools or workflows, the two go hand in hand. They, they basically drive one another. And so that's how we've been thinking about it. As we've generated you know, more and more data, now petabytes of data, we're also building up the analytical tools and you know, machine learning tools and so on and techniques to be able to process the data. And that's going to essentially direct us and allow us to collect even better data and more accurate data and so on. So it's this, it's this nice feedback loop. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, we're trying to change time constants in oncology. When you think about, um, you know, the adoption of, you know, communication technology, it took what, 75 years for you know the telephone to reach 100 million users, and a couple of years for Instagram, and and that's really where you have these platform shifts um, in terms of communication, uh, information dissemination, and data acquisition, and that's where being able to collect underlying molecular information in cancer patients, um, see response, um, see it before it you know, happens um, almost any time you want is fundamentally changing that time constant and will change you know, our progress exponentially. So that's, that's our view. So I would say that um, in terms of the question around kind of more data or kind of specific types of data, I, I think that with genomics we're now in this um, area where we're going from um, you know, lower quality data to higher quality data to hopefully very high quality data. Um, in other areas, it's much more early stage, it's much more experimental, and, you know, so I feel like there is, you know, kind of this um, life cycle of, you know, discovery and experimentation where there's a lot of data that's produced and you don't know if it's going to be valuable, what it should look like, what you should actually be measuring, and then over time, 
you're able to really um, kind of normalize that and create kind of more structured experiments around it, and then you know structured biomarkers about what you're really looking for. Mm -hmm. And that natural kind of experimental phase um, and you know frankly research phase has to happen in order for us to you know I think really move forward with understanding how we can utilize all this complex data, you know whether it be you know metabolomics, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's actually a very exciting time, and it's just going to get much more complicated before it, uh, before it gets much clearer. Um, and I think that the um, you know the the aspects around you know what um, you were talking about around um, you know chronic fatigue syndrome and really starting to create models mm -hmm. around the interplay of all mm -hmm. of those biomarkers is going to be really critical. Yeah. Okay. Um, from our perspective, I would also like to, to say that for us, technology is what drives everything. So you talked about biology driving technology. Well, we see it as technology driving biology, and certainly there's, there's a feedback there. Yeah. And um, what would be great is if we can develop technologies that can measure what's important. And so it really is a partnership with, uh, with intelligent use of data. Um, and, and have and develop technologies that will then be easy for clinics to use, easy for doctors to use, and just or even for people to use in their own homes the way that diabetics monitor their glucose um, with just the finger stick, and they can do that at home. Um, can we have some, th some things like that that monitor a whole lot of your health parameters, you know, in sort of a more unbiased way, without really knowing what might happen to you? Um, and and uh, allow you to give to sort of have that information uploaded to your doctor and 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 have and have the two of you be able to sort of work in a team to to develop the best plan for you. Um, you know, maybe you can eat a lot more burgers than somebody else. That would be the best case scenario. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just you know, to to really have have healthcare be a much more data driven and and that be enabled by it being much more technology driven. So. That's, that's our vision. That was also one of the questions. So um, thanks to all of you for your participation. Um, sorry that we went a couple minutes over. Also, let's give a big round of applause to Rekha for a nice meeting. Before I let you go, I want to tell you two things. Number one. If you like what we do at VLAB, what type of event we do, I want you to invite you to join us. And the way we do it, every first Tuesday of the month, we call it Pitch or Planning Meeting, where we volunteers, we meet, we pick up a topic, we have our own secret sauce, where topic gets selected by some voodoo science. No, it's a crowdsourcing, right? <laughs> So, but there is some secret sauce where we go and select the topic and then build the panel, what you see here. So, if you're interested, you're more than happy to join us. It happens every first Tuesday. There is an organization called Tech Code at, uh, in Mon Mountain View on Castro Street. So, if you sign up for our newsletter, we call it VBlast. You will get all the information. And I hope to see you there. And I always say, you know, when you come, we'll feed you a gourmet pizza, so you'll not go hungry. It happens from 7 to 8.30. So that's the one. Number two, uh, this is our last event of the season, so we are going to take a summer break. So I hope to see you guys again in September 2017. And in the meantime, have a wonderful summer. See you soon. Good night, everybody. SRI is a nonprofit research institution. We do research mostly sponsored by the US government. We also work with uh, commercial companies to work on the most exciting and important research, spanning across disciplines of academic interest. SRI is a place that incubates companies regularly. We spin out several companies a year, and these companies take the ideas from SRI research projects and turn them into practical reality that can actually go to market.